Welcome to the Mexpreneurs Podcast, the podcast about the stories of Mexican tech startup founders who are building world-class, fast-growing companies and having a positive impact at a large scale. My name is Sergio Chavez. I'm a Mexican based in Germany, a tech startup founder, executive, and mentor, and your host. Today, we have Dario Casanova with us. Dario is co-founder, co-CEO, and chief operations officer of SolarX, a fintech startup based in Austin, USA. SolarX is a crowdfunding platform that connects investors with opportunities in the solar energy sector, allowing anyone to invest in solar projects with as little as 10 US dollars. By providing industrial companies with solar energy at no upfront cost, SolarX helps them reduce their energy expenses while offering investors attractive returns. Since its inception, SolarX has gained traction by successfully delivering projects across Mexico and is now expanding into Colombia, attractive interest from international investors. Dario is originally from Monterrey, Mexico. He has a strong focus on entrepreneurship. This includes exploring several business ideas and starting a solar panel installation business together with his brother. He also gained valuable experience working at his family's diverse businesses, ranging from construction to large-scale industrial projects. His passion for innovation, coupled with a deep commitment to sustainability and a strong desire to leave a lasting impact for future generations, drives his work at SolarX. I hope you enjoy. Support for this episode comes from Skyflare, a cybersecurity company with a mission to make e-commerce safe for online shops and which currently protects dozens of Shopify-based businesses through its 360 degrees holistic protection. As an online shop owner, you know that every cent you spend in online advertisement counts, especially in Google AdWords. Therefore, keeping a tight control of your budget and the ROI are essential. Nevertheless, there are bad actors out there who can make those costs explode. Skyflare's Click Fraud Protection Solution helps you prevent and resolve those threats. At Mexpreneurs, we had the privilege to have Skyflare's founders in the podcast, including Juan Ocampo, a Mexican tech startup founder and Skyflare's chief operations officer. Visit skyflare.com slash mexpreneurs to learn more and also to get a 10% discount during your first three months of your annual subscription. Skyflare is at the moment available in Europe, Mexico, and Canada through the Shopify app store. Hello, Dario. Welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us, Dario. So please tell us, who is Dario Casanova? It's actually the first real time, not in school or anything like that, that I've been asked that question. I don't think I have an answer. I would say, honestly, something like a entrepreneur, tech innovator, leader, mentor, strategist, vigilante, martial artist, uh, you know, all that typical list that Batman has. But no, not really. I think I'm just a guy that had an idea. And I'm very passionate about leaving something behind that can help the future generations. Just in that sense that I always thought that it's important to actually try to do a change, right? A lot of people don't have the opportunity to do a big change. And that's why they never even try to make a change. So even if it's a big change or a small change, I'm just a, a guy that likes to push that idea and to work towards a small or a big change, whatever I can get. And where does that motivation to do that small or big change comes from? What's your inspiration for that? I think, honestly, my family, really. My dad, mainly. He grew up in Mexico and in Veracruz in a very, very small town, oyster fishing town. And he grew up very poor. And he started, you know, selling fish in Mexico through his little town. He used to drive to Monterrey, to Tampico, to the big cities and sell oysters there. And from there, he started growing to becoming one of the biggest fishing companies in Mexico, right? And after that, you know, he saw that company, he started doing projects all around. And that's when I was growing up. When I was very little, that's when he had the fishing stuff. And growing up, it was always like, what does your dad do? You know, when people ask me or friends and stuff like that. And I was like, I don't even know. He just does projects, three different projects, different stuff after the fishing ended. And all those projects, he always used to tell us about them. And they were always just so, like huge stuff. Maybe he closed like two or three out of all of the ones he did. But they were always like, oh, I'm working with these people that have this new innovation that does, I don't know, purify water for the rural communities in Mexico and a bunch of different projects that some went well, some went didn't. Whenever someone asked me, what do you want to do when you were older? I was just like, I want to do what my dad does. And it's just, you know, projects, just different type of things that can help. He always says that he just wants to leave one grain of sand he wants to put his grain of sand in the change that is happening in the world. And that's just a, the main inspiration for all of this. 
And also that versatility from what you mentioned, those, the, the fact that he started with fishing and did many different types of projects in different industries. And how exactly did that happen? That he went from fishing to purify water to all of these different things? I have no idea, really. I think uh, just from context, networking, really. Networking, which I guess comes to the point that it's one of the most important things you can do when you're doing a company. It's one of the most tiring things for sure, networking. And sometimes it can be a waste of time, but sometimes it can be the best thing you can do. So you have to go for it all the time. And just through networking, he got, I think he's probably the person that I know has the craziest contacts. He's been working with like CEOs of big companies in South Korea, in Romania, in Saudi Arabia with like sheiks and stuff. He sat down with presidents and, you know, a whole different stuff. They always see him like with a really high regard. And I don't think we're super rich or anything like that. You know, it's just people that networking has grown. And that's how he got all of these crazy opportunities. And he's been working on all that. And he still does, honestly. I don't think he's ever going to retire. <laughs> and that's what I also aim for. <laughs> so that means that since an early age, you started to get exposed to all these different type of projects. Also, were you actively working on these projects? Were you actively supporting him? Were you following a more traditional path of school and university? How exactly did your career trajectory look like? So definitely, I was not an A student, right? So I always had that concern of, damn, am I dumb? Or am I just lazy or whatever? Because work-wise, I used to help him. A little bit because my dad doesn't speak English or very little. So I used to, you know, translate documents since I was younger in school. It was like, oh, I have to do homework or in college I have to do my essay and I have to translate this contract for my dad. <laughs> so ChatGPT wasn't there yet. So it took a little bit more time. And that's how it, I started getting into that, helping him. Of course, I started. We had a construction company that lasted for a little while. I started as an accountant there, just trying to learn the ropes of different stuff and helping him, but on a very little scale. He was always like, Try to do your own thing and I'll give you the tools you need to grow in there. And then I'll bring you to meetings and stuff like that. And I started learning definitely from a younger age in that, in that regard, for sure. So you basically have your traditional path of school and going through different grades and university, but starting in parallel, experiencing business firsthand. Yeah, school was always the top thing I had to do. Even though I wasn't good at it, it was, you know, you have to graduate and you have to get your college degree. It doesn't matter what you get it in. My parents always thought that unless you do like a super specific career, you know, that's a business, maybe like a super specific engineering, you can basically do whatever you want. The college degree is kind of like a base where you can grow from. That's always a priority. And everything else was just, oh, do your own small things, whatever you can think of and whatever you can try. And they would help me with that. And what were some of those small things that you started trying and at what age did you start? I didn't really start actually working on anything, but I did a lot of business plans. <laughs> so a lot of ideas, a lot of business plans, a lot of crazy. That helps a lot because you do a lot of market research for all that. And I remember in college, I used to have the question that someone would come to talk about the business that they had. I started business, but with a focus on entrepreneurship. So I would guest speakers from the teachers would come and say, oh, I have this business and I started here in the same college. And I used to always think, okay, I understand your business, but how do you even get into that? How do you even start working in renewable energy? How do you even start working in construction? How do you even start? And the truth is Google, right? You know, you have to Google all that stuff and start doing that market research and business plans. And you start learning what the business Canva is and all of those tools that seem very basic, very, oh, it's just a homework that you would get in school. They actually work or at least to give you an idea of something. And everything that I did before SolarX and before any other business that I did was just the idea. And that market research, that's what gave me, I consider myself a very big C, but very shallow C. A little bit of everything, but not that deep knowledge anywhere, but a little bit of everything just because of doing that. And what were some of those business plans, some of those business ideas that you were doing? And I would assume that some of them, you probably went deeper and actually tried it. Some of them just remained there as a document. What was that rationale? That so a little bit of everything, really. I tried a restaurant that was focused on making like comfort food from YouTube videos. I did a recycling company here in Mexico. And that's when I realized, oh, trash is a serious business. You know, not anyone can get in. I did a small construction company. I'm talking about the business plans. I didn't really go into any detail or anything. The first real business that I started with my brother was solar panel installation, solar panels for houses. And I got into that 
because one of the people that worked with my father was a student from my college and he was an expert. He's an engineer in, and he designed solar panels and stuff like that. So he mentored us into the business. But besides that, a bunch of ideas, honestly, really. I, construction, restaurants, whatever you can think of, just the business plans, the model canvas, anything. <laughs> and you were doing that, all of that while studying. And also, did you have an actual job before starting, for example, your solar panel business? The good thing that I had is that since my focus was in entrepreneurship, many of the ideas that I had, I could use as a final project for an entrepreneurship class. So it was like, oh, your final test won't be a test. You just have to make a business or make a business model. And that's where everything of that came from mainly. And during college, I started working with my uncles as an accountant, but just like as an assistant accountant, you know, not real, like a, I just did, you know, like super simple stuff. And from there, went to work in a, all while in college in a construction company, and after the construction company, directly into the solar panels. So not a lot of experience <laughs> work with. And that business, together with your brother, about the solar panels, so you mentioned that someone that was working with your dad mentored you. So from all of these crazy business ideas that you were exploring and tinkering with before, why exactly did you go for the solar panels and decided to actually go and start a business and give it a try? I think all the ideas could have been it. It's just a matter of which one really becomes feasible, you know, which one you can actually see a path for and you can see the money coming in for it. So the easy part of the solar panels was that I myself could go to the roof of a house and build the system because it's really, really easy, honestly. Nowadays, they do like pre-built kits that do, you know, do the structuring and you can put the solar panels on top of that. And you don't really have to do much, but you have you only need a drill to basically secure everything in. And that's it. My brother, he's an electric engineer, so he knew all of the cable management and all that. That was the first thing that we saw that we could actually, oh, go to my uncle's house and install solar panels on the roof and just charge whatever for doing that. And we did it via YouTube videos and learning with our mentor to make sure we didn't connect stuff wrongly and everything. So that's how we kind of stuck to it because we were actually making a little bit of money out of it. And that's how it started. And so that basically means your brother and you started installing the panels. And what happened with that business? Is it still going? How big has it grown since then? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's still going. My brother officially became the CEO. I'm kind of like a little bit out now because I'm mainly focusing on SolarX, right? So the idea of SolarX and all that comes from this business, which is called Bruder, which it means brother in German, and then Green, Bruder to Green. And I don't know what that name I didn't choose. My brother chose <laughs> He was in Germany studying at one point and he speaks German. So he was like, oh, brother, it's a cool name. And that one, yeah, it's still going. My brother is taking the lead of it. I help with uh, all of the financial stuff. And I started SolarX, which is the financial arm for all of the projects that Brother Green does. So yeah, it's still going. We will be right back for a conversation with our guest. Support for this episode comes from Partnership Leaders, the leading community of partnership professionals and executives in SaaS and tech with over 1,500 members globally. We're living the decade of the ecosystem, and every CEO needs to become a partnership leader. Just take a look at the top companies in the world today, like Microsoft, Google, and Apple. They have all become platform companies, and partnership executives in IT have been the ones leading these transformation. Partnership Leaders brings these executives together and is building a playbook to enable CEOs and business leaders across industries to transform their organizations into platform companies. If you're a tech startup founder, Partnership Leaders is the place for you to learn how to leverage partnerships to take your business to the next level. I'm a member of PL and co-host of the Germany chapter and have seen firsthand the richness and value of this incredible community. Visit partnershipleaders.com to learn more and to apply to become a member. Make sure to mention in your application that Mexpreneurs refer you so you can receive a special price if your application is accepted. And please walk us briefly into SolarX. So in the previous conversation that you and I have, you briefly walked me through the origins of SolarX and how it's connected to these solar panels installation business that your brother and you created. So can you please just briefly describe, so what exactly is SolarX? How did SolarX start it? So actually this company, uh, Brother Green, with my brother, it started, as you said, you know, started growing and we got out of the residential area and we went to the industrial sector. And working in the industrial sector, it's a whole different game, right? It's a whole different company. It's a whole different business, really. Because 
you cannot get into the industrial sector without contacts. If you want a client, let's say you want to put solar panels on the roof of an Audi factory or an um, automobile, whatever factory, you need to know who's the decision maker there. And you cannot reach them via call. You have to, or LinkedIn maybe nowadays, but it's a little hard, or emails. All those cold intros are really hard to close a sale on that big of a scale when you do solar panels in industry. So we realized working on that made deal closing really slow, like super slow. And whenever we got to the deal, to the decision maker, they would always give us an excuse or either they were sick, so they couldn't take the call or they don't no longer work there or the budget for solar panels wasn't a priority or it would be a priority, but for next year. So we had to push it for next year. You know, there were a million different excuses and there are today, still today, a million different excuses that, or reasons. I wouldn't say excuses, reasons really. Reasons that they don't purchase a solar panel. And we thought, how can we make this faster? How can we make them close the deal without having to think about it so much. So that's how the idea of SolarX was born. And SolarX, what it is exactly, it's a crowdfunding company, a fintech, that we offer our, well, we have what we call clients and we have what we call users, right? Clients are the industrial companies that want solar energy and users are the crowd funders, the investors in, through SolarX. So what we give the users is the ability to invest in solar panels that will sell energy to a client. So let's say we go to a steel manufacturing company and we tell them, hey, we're going to put solar panels on your roof and we're going to sell you that energy that those solar panels are generating at a cheaper price than what you're currently paying. So without having to invest a single dollar because we do the investment, you're going to get cheap energy and clean energy that you can use for marketing or whatever, right? Or to reach goals because nowadays, you know, of course, they, in the industry has to reach certain goals of sustainability and stuff like that. So that's on the client side. And for users, we tell them you're not going to be the owner of a solar panel that is selling energy to this big company, industrial company, and they're going to give you money monthly because that you have to pay for energy monthly, right? So it's a monthly return for the investors. Anyone can invest with as little as $10. And this allows us to give investors a big return because the returns are around 15% per year in dollars. That's a, a, lot, a lot compared to what usual investments are in the United States. And the clients, they cannot say no because they're not spending a single dollar on any of this. They are getting free solar panels that are going to give them cheap energy. And that's kind of how the idea started. I don't know if I went too long on that. <laughs> no, I think it's fantastic of how basically Solar X was born from the necessity of overcoming these obstacles that you were facing in the pre-sales process and actually have you build these platform to bring together the users, the clients, as you mentioned. You were mentioning about US. So my understanding is that the solar panel business started in Monterrey, but actually the solar act is incorporated in the US. So why exactly is it that US became the home of Solar X? We started, as you say, in Monterrey, Mexico, and we tried to be able to do crowdfunding. You need to be a fintech company, register whichever entity in the country that you do. It takes care of money laundering and all of those problems because you can easily steal money, right? So in the U.S. is the SEC, and in Mexico, it's an equivalent. But the one in Mexico is not as developed as the SEC, I would say. And when we tried to get registered with them and regulated by the equivalent of the SEC, it was really hard, like really, really hard. It would take us like two years only to try and register it. We needed to do 800 pages of legal documents, and we had to pay, what was like $200,000 to try and get the license. If we didn't get it, we will have to try again next year, basically. And in the U.S., it was a matter of paying 15K and in three months, you're <laughs> registered and licensed and you can start operating. It's not even feasible. I think in Mexico, they do it like that because they don't want the market to get flooded with companies that do this. I think that's why they make it so hard. That's one of the main reasons why we started. We turned our eyes towards Austin, Texas, right? And also the entrepreneurship network. We knew we wanted this to be a startup, so we had exponential growth. Investors, big investors that come in, investors that know people, they can get us into companies, they can get solar panels into industry. And Austin was a really good place to start. I did my high school in Austin, so I knew the city, and we started applying to accelerators in Austin, and we got into one that's called International Accelerator. But uh, we got in there, and that's how we moved to Austin and based the business there. That comparison that you mentioned about building the business in Mexico versus building the business in the U.S., it, it's like day and night, especially for a small company that is just getting started. That's the whole world of difference. It's incredible. But yeah, also the fact that you already have experience network in Austin definitely made it, I think, a very uh, easy decision to go into that direction. 
it's uh you know talking about the difference of the hardships of starting a business it was and since we wanted to raise money what was easier right raise two hundred thousand dollars just for a license try to convince someone to give you two thousand dollars two hundred thousand just for a license or try to convince someone to give you fifteen thousand and you can start operating right so it was uh it was no brainer and definitely the idea of going to Austin, my uh, co-founder, Eddie, he loves Austin. He's completely in love with it and he, he doesn't want to leave. <laughs> I have to travel in between Mexico and Austin a lot, but he's always there. He doesn't want to come back to Mexico. So it's a beautiful city. It's a good place for any startup, any entrepreneur to go to. But now switching gears into that connection to Mexico. So you went from Monterrey to Austin. You spent most of the time in Austin. But what's still your connection to Mexico? How does it look like today? So today, most of our projects are still here in Mexico. The reality of being a fintech in the U.S. is that you can invest anywhere in the world as long as the project gives you the returns that you're looking for, your users or your investors. So we base our projects in wherever the energy or the electricity has the highest cost because the higher we can sell it, the larger the return we can give our investors, right? And most of the projects that we have in the U.S. are bigger, but they have a lower return. Because there's a lot of more electricity, there's a lot of more cleaner electricity in the market, so it doesn't sell as high. And in Mexico, we have places like Cancun, for example, that has problems with electricity. So if you give a company solar panels there, they buy it. They buy the energy for a really high price because they need it. There's no electricity over there, right? So the returns are very high. And that's kind of why we've been moving. I myself, I am a CEO and COO, and I have to go to the projects themselves. I have to go with the clients. I have to go... uh, see how everything's going. And now we're actually moving as well into Colombia, to projects in Colombia, because it's a super good market for electricity as well. We have some contacts there. So now I'm traveling between the US, Mexico, and Colombia, US, Mexico, Colombia, a little road trip that I take every two months based in Austin. And then I just go to look at the price or talk with clients anywhere else. And my family is in Mexico, so I have to come visit every now and then. Which is also a very compelling reason to keep connected to Mexico. I think that happens to all of us who are living abroad. That's always one of the big motivations. But of course, in your case, I think what you mentioned is super interesting. The fact that also in Mexico, the cost of energy is significantly higher than it is in the U.S. and therefore a great market for the solution that SolarX provides. That if we're reaching the end of our conversation, then something that we always do with our guests is basically ask them for their best advice for other aspiring founders. I think you've had the experience to see firsthand your dad as an entrepreneur, try yourself, multiple things, build businesses in Mexico. Now in the US, you have a super interesting track record. What would you recommend to someone who's looking into going into that direction as you as a founder? So I think I have three main points, short ones that I usually tell other aspiring founders. The first one, and I think the most important one, which is probably the one that people hear the most is A co-founder, finding a co-founder, but a good co-founder. You don't want someone that can do the same things that you can do. That's actually super dangerous because if you have a disagreement or whatever, and if you do the same thing, um, why do you need each other, right? You need to find a co-founder that has the same values of work that you do so they can, you know, stay up late with you and don't fuss about it. (laughs) And that can bring something into the company that you cannot do yourself. So that's why they always say, you know, surround yourself with the geniuses of the industry and that way you'll grow You don't have to be the expert or anything, but if you surround yourself with experts and you find yourself someone that has the same work values and brings something that you can't do to the table, that'll help immensely. And if you don't do that, it'll hurt you immensely. So that's a very important point. The other point is that don't be afraid to pivot because pivoting is very, very important. SolarX didn't start as SolarX. It's been two years in the works of other ideas that had to do with cryptocurrencies and debt. And a bunch of different things that we had to pivot and turn it into what it is today. But today it's a fine-tuned solution, right? It didn't start just like that. It sounds easy, like, oh, let's just crowdfund for solar panels and that's it. But that idea didn't come from... It came from pivoting like crazy. And sometimes you can get a little bit too attached to an idea, to a solution that you came up with and, oh, this is going to save the world. But the reality is that you have to make it marketable and it has to be able to be financially feasible. So you can pivot. Don't be afraid to pivot and move to wherever it needs to go to be able to sell. And the last one is going off of that pivoting thing is don't always focus on ideas and solutions. Try to find the problem or the need of the market that you want to get into. Getting into a market itself is just a matter of Googling whatever that market looks like. And now ChatGPT can do almost, or Gemini can do almost everything for you, right? But um 
sometimes it's hard to find that starting point of whatever you want to do. And sometimes you start with an idea of, oh, I want to do a self-cleaning pool. That sounds super cool, but who's going to buy it? Who needs it? Who will actually, you know, use it? So sometimes it's very important to focus before the idea, focus on the problem or the needs or whatever someone wants. Because us, for example, in Solarix, we're not solving a problem. It's an investment platform. We're not solving anything, but we know people want to invest and make money. We focus on the need. That's where you start, basically. <laughs> That's incredible. So good co-founder, pivoting and focusing on the need or on the problem at hand. On the problem on the market, definitely. So you can start making money. <laughs> And of course, in terms of Solar X, I'm very much looking forward to our next conversation together with Eddie because we'll dive deeper into Solar X and, and all the great things that you're doing. But Dario, thank you very much for this fantastic conversation, for sharing all of those golden nuggets. And yeah, I'm very much looking forward to our next conversation. Yeah, definitely. No, on the contrary, thank you for having me. It's always super fun to talk about all of this. And if we know it's going to help someone or reach someone that might make a change, that's, you know, that's what we're here for. So thank you. Yeah, and I know Eddie is super excited to come in here. So and we go back to making a positive change what we mentioned at the very beginning. It certainly will do. It certainly will have a positive impact. Definitely. Exactly. Dario, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And thanks to you for joining us today. Please remember to subscribe via your favorite podcast app to be notified about new episodes and share with us your feedback. We would love to hear from you. Thank you also to the Maxpreneurs team. Valeria Morel, Héctor Barragán from Hypervoltage, Francisco Jaimes, Pamela Elizalde, Katia Cruz, Rocío Marroquín. I am Sergio Chávez. See you next time.